Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Blue Origin's New Glenn is currently trying to launch the Escapade spacecraft to Mars. However, on Sunday, after watching for a couple of hours, they scrubbed the launch due to a combination of weather and uh, ground service equipment. This morning, they cancelled it due to space weather. Yes, in the last 24 hours, the Earth has been hit by two successive coronal mass ejection events, which led to large geomagnetic storms. I saw lots of photos last night from people all across the US seeing the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights. I did not see them because, well, I was under clouds, but actually I was also supposed to go to a show and see Nico Case, so, you know, it wasn't a bad night for me. But after last night's activity, the Earth's magnetosphere is still very much ringing with energy, and they're expecting a further impact today which will probably excite the status again, so it's understandable that Blue Origin might push this launch back a day. Immediately after the scrub on Sunday, there were some questions about whether Blue Origin would be allowed to launch because of the FAA's current restriction on commercial launches launching during daylight, but they did manage to get an exemption for that, and it sounds like the sort of shutdown situation is coming to an end. But we don't want to talk about government shutdowns, we want to talk about why space weather might lead to a launch cancellation. What are the problems that can be caused by these energetic events from the sun? Now you might have heard things like solar storms, solar flares, coronal mass ejections and geomagnetic storms. These are all separate but interrelated effects. Solar flares are high energy effects that occur in the solar atmosphere. Typically, they're going to produce an increase in the brightness and a lot of high-energy photons in the form of ultraviolet and X-rays. So those will get to Earth in eight minutes because they're moving at the speed of light. Frequently associated with a solar flare, you will have a solar radiation storm. And that's where the magnetic reconfiguration uh, essentially you know, accelerates protons. And those can travel at relativistic speeds and arrive at the Earth minutes after the photons do. Now, these protons are the ones that we have to worry about causing radiation damage to satellites or even people. And you can see the effects of this radiation in many of these solar telescope systems. When the event happens, immediately afterwards, we get a lot of speckling from radiation that is hitting the sensor on the cameras. So the next thing we talk about are coronal mass ejections, and that is where the sun is blowing off a lot of material, a lot of gas, and it flows through like along with the solar wind, and it takes a couple of days to hit the Earth. But there's a lot of mass being ejected, millions of tons of hydrogen, and if it comes the right direction, then it can indeed c interact with the Earth. So yeah, most coronal mass ejections will go off in the wrong direction, but in this case we had a couple which basically lined up directly with the Earth and impacted last night, November 11th. And when I say they hit the Earth, I mean what they really do is they hit the Earth's magnetic field because this extends out into space and these charged particles as they come in, they hit the magnetic field and they push the magnetic field around. It's kind of like a bubble that's blown out into space, but if you can imagine a bubble floating around in the air, if you think about blowing on a bubble, you see that it distorts, right, because of the airflow. Well, the plasma coming from the sun that is suddenly much denser, much more energetic, that changes the magnetic field and the entire field shifts and wobbles in response. And so those changes to the magnetic field, they reach the surface. And as they reach the surface, that means they change the point where the magnetic field dives down into the surface of the Earth. And to the casual observer, that means the point at which auroras can be seen comes further and further south. So again, we have solar flares, solar radiation storms, coronal mass ejections, which lead to geomagnetic storms, and they all actually kind of have the same root cause. It's generally believed that most of these energetic events are triggered by a process called magnetic reconnection. So the sun is a plasma, and when you have a magnetic field in the plasma, because the plasma is conductive, if the plasma moves, it will drag the magnetic field along with it. And so if you have a process that's moving the plasma about, then it can stretch and twist these magnetic fields. So if, for example, you have a convective process where hot plasma is rising and cold plasma is sinking, that will pull the magnetic fields with them and add energy to the magnetic fields. And if you look at the entire sun, the poles rotate at a different speed to the equator, so the magnetic fields are sort of getting stretched as the sun rotates over time. And this builds up electromagnetic energy, and magnetic field lines that are going in opposite directions can get pinched together, whereupon they reconnect and suddenly there is a release of energy. 
And this can be a mind-boggling amount of energy. So uh, the largest solar flare that was measured, I think, was about 10 to the 25 joules, which in, well, more easily understandable units is about 10 billion megatons of TNT equivalent. And so the way all that energy actually comes out will depend a lot on the exact configurations of the magnetic fields and the this atmosphere of the sun. But we can have flares without coronal mass ejections, and you can have things that look like coronal mass ejections without flares, but generally they will all tend to happen together and some part will be stronger than others. And then there's a third factor of coronal mass ejections having to more or less be pointed at the Earth to have a serious effect on the Earth's environment. And so, now, what are the potential effects on spacecraft? What is causing Blue Origin and the Escapade team to stand down for a day because of these storms? Well, the most obvious one is in the initial radiation storm. Those protons are streaming out of the sun, coming into Earth at very high speeds. That's ionizing radiation. Now, this is a camera mounted on Soho pointing at the sun. And when the initial event happens, you'll see a lot of noise on that sensor there. Those white streaks are ionizing radiation hitting the pixels on, on the sensor and triggering them. These sensors are semiconductor devices which are exposed to the light. And when the photons come in, they knock electrons off and these electrons get measured, captured and counted. And that's how you measure how bright a specific pixel is. But this kind of charge movement can happen in any semiconductor device, even one which isn't exposed to light. Ionizing radiation can penetrate through the spacecraft into any semiconductor device and cause charges to move around in ways which are not part of the design. And so it's possible that it just flips the state of a single bit of computer memory, which generally isn't a big deal, but if it's the wrong bit, it can be really, really terrible. What it could do is cause a, a system to reset and it could take some time to come back up. And when you're launching a spacecraft, things are time sensitive. You don't want your spacecraft going into safe mode when you are trying to get it to boost into the correct orbit. And so that's why you delay the launch. But of course, in, over the duration of the mission, the spacecraft is going to get exposed to radiation that is going to slowly degrade components. And, you know, spacecraft have to be designed so that if there is a problem that they can recover from safe mode. Other components that can get damaged by the radiation are the solar panels. Again, those are semiconductor devices. And in the long term, the radiation can cause changes to the semiconductor structure, which allows like some of the holes or electrons to propagate in ways that eventually lead to degradation of the performance of the spacecraft. So anyway, these are long-term effects. They're not the kind of thing that you would delay a launch for 24 hours for. So anyway, yeah, these radiation storms, they can have an effect if they happen at just exactly the wrong time. But as I said, they come like minutes after the initial flare. So why are we still concerned about it? We've had the flare a couple of days ago and then the coronal mass ejection hit the Earth last night. Well, all of these events are coming from an active region on the sun, a sunspot that's you know, got the magnetic field super twisted up and it's just ready to let it go. That event, that sunspot is slowly rotating around the sun and it is still there. It is still potentially active. So the chances of this kicking off again during the launch are relatively high. I'll also point out that last night on the International Space Station, the Russian uh, cosmonauts, they slept in a different location from normal to reduce the chances of the radiation getting in and affecting them. And that's because we're watching this angry region of the sun slowly moving around. So now let's talk about the geomagnetic storm side of things. As we mentioned, you know, this is the magnetic field moving around and, uh, you know, affecting the Earth's environment. This can have a lot of effects. First of all, these changes to the magnetic field, they change plasma densities in low Earth orbit, and that will change radio frequency uh, propagation. They can slow down radio waves slightly, and that will affect things like GPS. It can produce quite large errors in GPS that can be, take a while to be subtracted out by the systems that do this. The moving magnetic fields can affect things like power grids, uh, which is obviously not a great thing to lose when you're in the middle of a launch. They can generate spurious signals, you know, voltages on basically any antenna. There are a myriad of ways in which these geomagnetic storms can affect communications over the Earth. And again, you don't want to lose your communications when you're launching a payload that has a very limited time window to do things. And thirdly, there is a concern with Earth's atmosphere, which can be changed significantly by these events. Now, a few years ago in 2022, there was a whole bunch of Starlink satellites which were lost 
because a solar energetic event caused the Earth's atmosphere to puff out and become denser at higher altitudes. Starlink satellites were launched into a lower you know, at orbit, and then they used their ion thrusters to push them up to a higher orbit. Well, on one launch, they launched into an environment where the Earth's atmosphere had puffed out due to solar activity, so the atmospheric drag was high enough that it made it hard for them to gain altitude, and this, combined with the communications problems, led to the majority of the satellites being unable to establish communications and get themselves oriented correctly and fight against the atmospheric drag to raise themselves into orbit. And I think they lost the majority of the satellites on that particular launch. Now, in the case of Escapade, the spacecraft is launching into a relatively low parking orbit, and then it will perform a boost into its heliocentric orbit. So these are time-sensitive operations, and it's completely understandable that you want to make sure that you're not pushing your luck. And Escapade, in particular, it's launching in this weird off-year launch window. It's going to go out away from Earth and then come back to Earth and then get sent off to Mars. If they had to miss this window entirely they would have another launch window next year. And there's a lot of flexibility within this specific launch window, so it's understandable that they can wait a couple of days and get this right. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.